Hello and welcome to the Composer's Workshop. My name is Mimi Waitsman and I'm the Senior Curator of Musical Collections and Cultures at the Horniman Museum and Gardens in South East London. The seed for the Composer's Workshop was planted by Jane Chapman, a harpsichordist well known for championing new works for old instruments. On learning of the Horniman's Hear It Live program using historical instruments from the recently dispersed Finchcock's collection, she saw an opportunity to unite them with the creativity of her current composition students. The Horniman was delighted with the idea, and the three composers were introduced to the 1668 Guaracino Virginals in December 2019. Intrigued and inspired by the instrument's distinctive features, each wished to write a new composition for it. These would be premiered by Jane as one of the weekly half-hour Hear It Live programs being presented in the museum's music gallery through the support of the National Lottery Heritage Fund. But then the COVID pandemic struck. Although live programming was suspended, the reconfiguration of Hear It Live into a digital online series invited this further development. Rather than just hearing the composer's pieces, there was a chance to elucidate intricacies of the compositional process and to make them more widely accessible. And so this set of videos, the composer's workshop, was born. I hope you enjoy them. Hello, I'm Peter Falconer. I'm a composer and the chief archivist of SeatonSnook.com, an uh, archive of sounds and music from the mysterious northeast town which vanished in the late 60s. I'd like to present to you The Crofter's Dream by Gaynor Lee. Gaynor Lee was a piano teacher and composer from the town who was born there in 1893 and died in 1957, 11 years before the town vanished. The piece was discovered amongst papers at Kirkleatham Manor, a nearby estate, and accompanying it was a letter from uh, Lee's school friend, uh, Jane Hopper, who studied piano and harpsichord at Manchester. Gaynor and I visited Kirkleatham Manor on a school trip. We were both very taken by the box harpsichord there. I remember it had the most intriguing painting on the underside of the lid, an ancient city whose inhabitants had long since disappeared. The caretaker let us both play on it a little. At the time, we found it funny that it was so out of tune. Later, our music teacher taught us how there were old instruments with different tunings, and so that some keys sounded beautiful, others sounded more mysterious, or even evil. Gaynor told me, a crofter living on the wide open told a story of a dream that he had. He was sat peacefully among his cows, looking out over the sea. A restlessness in the waves brought with it the factories that now stand at Seaton. With the factories came the staining of the land, the asphyxiation of the children, the endless screaming fires. As the crofter stared into the poisoned turquoise pools, he heard the cry of Jacob Cox's horse and the final destruction of Seton Snook came crashing down. He awoke at peace, certain that the earth would finally reclaim what was hers.
<laughs> I'm really intrigued by your relationship with Gaynor Lee. Um, well, um, Gaynor was from a town in the northeast in the County Durham coast called Seaton Snook. Um, it uh, mysteriously vanished in 1968, and I. Uh, I've created an archive of sounds and music from the town. Um, it was full of uh, the fishermen and uh, musicians and preachers. And uh, there was a, a huge factory there, all sorts of different things going on. Um, the only catch with it um, is that uh, it didn't actually exist. Um, the whole, um, <laughs> the whole, the whole thing is is a uh, what I call a parafictional archive. Mm -hmm. There was a seat and snook. It was there in the northeast. There was a factory there. There were fishermen there, but it was a much smaller place than the big bustling town that I've created. Um, Gaynor Lee um, is a creation of mine, and in writing the piece. Uh, I, the process is I have my, uh, my idea of the town, what happened there, um, how it was built, how it was conceived, uh, its whole history that I've populated with various characters, I fear how, what would they have done, how would they have lived. Um, how would they have spoken, what sort of, and in Gaynor's case, what sort of music would she write? So I have Gaynor's biography, um, of all sorts of things that have nothing to do with the piece, but they're going to hurt making it. Because that's, that's yeah. what I'm thinking about this piece, because of all the pieces that I've been playing, yeah. this to me is, it's it's full of references to other kind of musical forms, like yeah. folk music, mm. uh, fairground music. Yeah. There's a bit that sounds like trombones going wow, 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 wow. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's got a huge, it's, huge, it's very evocative of different things. Yeah. Um, and so I wondered, um, did you... Did that happen as a natural thing? So, so you mean this lovely sort of folk tune you've got? It's just gorgeous. Is that something that you've heard before, or that comes completely from your own imagination? Well, so there's there are sort of two sides to the tradition. There is the actual tradition of music that was going on at the time that would have been heard in the northeast. So, um, particular types of writing, particular instruments, so that in particular is based on the Northumbrian small pipes, mm. which I've written a, a few tunes for. Um, I've written, they are ascribed to another composer, not yeah. Gaynor. Um, um, but then there's the local traditions as well. So that tune is um, appears in a, in a couple of other pieces on the archive, and we're not sure where it came from. There's um, there's a, there's a split uh, down the middle in how I work in that I am at one stage I'm the artist and I'm making all these bits and pieces and then on the other side I'm the archivist and I'm having to discover the pieces. So as the archivist, I don't know where the tune came from. Uh, it comes from all sorts of different places. So so the archive. Um... Oh, that's very interesting. So, so it's what comes first. Is it like you go to your archive in your imagination, and this thing pops up? Well, yeah, the diff different things influence different influence other things. So, with the um, the first time I wrote this tune, it was for a horn chorale for the workers at the local zinc factory, and they play a tune that sounds very, very similar to this, um, and. I wrote this as a piece um, with no compo with a, an unknown composer. We're not sure it's ascribed to a chap called John Franklin, who, but he wasn't a composer, so we don't know if he wrote it. So if I put my archivist hat on, I'm looking at this piece, and then find this new piece by Gaynor Lee, written in 1910, and realise, oh, it's the same thing. How were they related? And it's solving the mystery. Sometimes I know what the the answer is, I've already decided that, but I haven't revealed it in the archive. Sometimes it's a complete mystery to me as well. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. I have so so these, this, this sort of lovely um, sort of folky tune mm -hmm. and then this sort of more um, um pop up. Yeah. With that kind of accompaniment. And mm -hmm. then these rather dramatic chords where you've really yeah. uh, made a lot of the tune. 
the kind of scary moments there because there's a huge the sort of pro programmatic yes, thread through the piece mm. um, when you talk about it yeah. this, this whole world being destroyed and these turquoise lakes of yeah. pollution and then the, the whole piece kind of resolves at the end again using the tuning in such a way that we get these lovely pure pure mm. sounds um, and then these sort of yeah. Mad, mad scales and things. Yeah. Um, and also you've got the kind of sort of minimalist, these kind of little yes. minimalist type yeah, yeah, patterns yeah. as well. Um, so, so you've you've pulled together a huge amount of different kinds of musical material in this piece. Mm. Um, and I'm just sort of intrigued about these kind of ideas, how you see them fitting on this wonderful instrument, the Virgin Mills. I mean, what, how, how would you adapt something that you wrote for, for what, what yeah. some sort of yeah. Northumbrian pipes or whatever it would be yeah. to, to fit on this? What is it that, that inspires you about this particular instrument? What I really love is in its, the, the tuning of it has such a great way of telling a story. And I like, I'm very drawn to things that make you feel uneasy, but you're not quite sure why. And so in the story of Seat and Snook in general is told in the crofter's dream, its whole history from, you know, building the, the sort of rise and fall of this, of this little town. And so when things are starting to go wrong, for the for the place when there's certain factors going, there's a sense of doom, and so you can exploit the stranger tunings. Uh, so when it's uh, you know if you use the G sharp as an A flat, for example, and, and things just sound that's a bit too you know modern ears, you just think that sounds a little bit uncomfortable, and you're not quite sure why, and then later on you'll use a, a chord, I use a chord that's completely just sounds completely wrong you would never why on earth would you play that chord on this particular instrument it just sounds uh, you know but what it seems to me yeah. though is that you've you've used chords which are actually quite common mm. um, but because of the tuning they sound yeah. weird yes so it's not like you've done any kind of wacky chords no, at, at all, all. you use quite right. conventional musical language and yeah. a musical kind of palette uh, and because of it being on this instrument, yeah. and because of the tuning, it's it is it it sets off very strange, yeah, strange well, kind of vibes. That, that was one of the great things about being asked to write for this instrument specifically, and I thought it would be great to. I, I thought it would be important to not just, um, which is how I weaved that into the story as well. The the idea that Gainer wasn't just writing a harpsichord piece or a Virgil's piece; it was written specifically for. Um, an instrument with this tuning and this particular instrument in my history it was previously at Kirkleatham Manor and of place. course the whole image thing yeah because we have this fabulous painting that probably isn't contemporary with the instrument no uh, but it's it's so so beautiful I'm just going to take this away so yeah we see the whole glory of it and that's another that's another I thing I, it's just there's something uneasy about it. The fact there's nobody there mm -hmm. and there's nothing in the background. You think, where is everybody? There's something, mm -hmm. yeah, just slightly unsettling. And actually, I'm just noticing there is kind of almost a sense of sea in the back. Yeah. yeah. You can't really tell if that is sea, but. Mm. Uh, and I think the whole industrial revolution, and they have this whole idea too, this tremendous civilization, this classical civilization, yeah. and you have the industrial revolution yeah. that happened, it destroyed everything. Yeah, yeah. Then you have this, this, real, this whole classical place that's left. To ruin. Yeah, it's it's it, and I yeah. I, and part of how I work is, is drawing these, finding these little coincidences and finding these links between things that were never intended. So this um, and I um, just as as a weird side thing, um, I was at another instrument museum many uh, uh, several years ago, and. This instrument was there before it arrived at the Horniman. Yes. Um, uh, so it wasn't restored or anything like that. But before it was turned. Probably, probably it's quite well restored, but not as well restored. As not it as well was. restored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and so it, I thought that was a an, a really interesting thing for me that this instrument would pop up mm -hmm. in a different setting mm -hmm. and intersect so uh, it's, it's just another coincidence. So yeah, it was, it was great too. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 when I've told people about it, I've said that it's um, 
the, the, the Holy Wind has, um, uh, you know, I'd say restored, you use the word restore, but restore this new, you know, this, this, this instrument and is uh, celebrating it and its possibilities with three new compositions. I think that's, uh, that's how I feel about the whole project. I think it's great that you've built in this idea of we need a record of its sound and what it can do uh, as part of the project. It's not just it's restored. Now we're going to put it behind glass. We want to make we want to make sure that we've got a record of of, of why you restored it in the first place. Uh, um, sorry, I, I, I just think too. There's this whole thing about uh, working with three different composers. <coughs> who have three different approaches, completely different approaches. And that for me has been really fascinating. So when we perhaps think of music from the past, again, we tend to pigeonhole certain composers and certain instruments. Um, and of course, they're as diverse almost as, as people now, but diverse in a different way. Um, so I think for me, this is a celebration of the diversity of, of composers writing the 21st century who are, as you said, always confined by this instrument and to see what that unleashes in the kind of new world of new music, uh, I think is really fascinating, you know, moving away from the instrument almost to see what you have produced as creative artists. I think when, when I've mentioned that I'm doing this project, uh, the first thing people do is they interrupt me and go, I know the body but I've been there before. <laughs> and they share their memories of, of the museum with me. And I think that really inspired where my work went, is this idea of memory of place and of capturing that, that past, that enjoyment. And, um, and I think, as, as Ollie said, the first time we came over the workshop uh, day um, was just really lovely, and, and it was that, that beautiful memory that carried on. Uh, so I don't get to the end of my story when I mention projects, I hear about other memories from the museum. Um, but I, I really like that. I don't think I have too much more to add because I think a lot's been said. So I think I'd just summarize it with perhaps three words and that would be unique, um, educational and rewarding.